Christians to be different. And um, I was kind of inspired by the song that we sang tonight. I love that song. Loved it for a long time. Um, and it's so true. But to say, when we say we want to be different, I think sometimes we don't really know what that means. Thank you. So when you guys look into your everyday world, I'm sure you see people that look different on the outside, right? But most of the time, those people will have the same things inside of them, which is probably not very godly. You guys see this at school all the time. People that act the same or try to act like everybody else, I'm sure you guys see that all the time. And that's annoying, right? When people are trying to, people follow you around and copy everything you do, that's pretty annoying. What we're called to be is different as Christians, and that is, doesn't go for just teenagers. It goes for everybody. Um, but I guess as you get older, the call to be different is different. So um, when you're in school and you're called to be different, does that mean that you dress differently sometimes? Not necessarily. Does that mean that you speak a different language most of the time? No. I mean, you can, but that's not what different means. Different is on the inside, but what's on the inside does come out. <clears throat> so today I want to talk about Numbers 14, a couple of guys who were different and what happened to them because of it. Okay. Um, starting with Numbers 14, verses 1 through 9. I'm reading the New Living Translation, so it's a little different. Um, then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted amongst themselves. Let's choose a new leader to go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Um, so that's the first part of this. What's happening is we're jumping into the children of Israel. They're about to go in the promised land. They're right at the promised land, and they send these spies in to see. And um, I believe it's 12 spies. Um, 12 spies go in, and then 10 of them say, we can't do this. Huge people, right? Gabe, have you heard this story before? There's giants. They have all these weapons. We can't defeat these people. And two people, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, oh, that's no problem. They came back to the people of Israel and told them that there was no problem going in and defeating these giants with these weapons. But ten other people said that they couldn't do it. So right off the bat, Joshua and Caleb are different. Their perspective caused them to stand out. Their perspective was God. That's why it was different. Their perspective was, we trust God and we're committed to him. And we know we can do it. We know God can do it, actually. They didn't even think, they didn't say we can do it. They knew God was going to do it. Because God had promised them this land for years and years. If you guys have heard the story of the children of Israel, 
They've been in the desert, walking away from Egypt for years and years and years, looking for their promised land. And God promised them this land, he brought them to this land, and yet they still didn't believe him. Only two people, Joshua and Caleb, believed him. And so their perspective made them different. In verse 10 it says, But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. You guys know what stoning is? They literally throw rocks at you and kill you? Wow, it's crazy. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites in, at the tabernacle. <coughs> the Israelites, when Joshua and Caleb came back, instead of being like, hey, listen to these guys, they, got, they have a different perspective. They're talking about God over here. They said, let's kill them. Why, do you think? They were afraid. They were afraid. That's right. They were afraid of what was going to happen. They were afraid and they thought... If everybody's doing it this way, and these two are the only two out of the millions of us that are going this way, I'm going to go with the crowd. Does that sound familiar? I'm going to do what these millions of people over here are doing. I don't know what those two crazy people are doing over there. I'm going to go with the crowd. It's always, I'm not even going to lie to you, it's always easier to go with the big crowd. Not just sometimes, always. Especially if there's not two of you, if there's one. Because you know, if, if there was a group of, of 12 people, and there was you that felt a certain way, but then you had someone with you that felt that same way, you would have some companionship, right? You would have something to hold on to. But what happens when you're the only one? <clears throat> you're alone. When you're the only one in a crowd of people that thinks differently, that is intimidating and that's scary. But when your perspective is God, that's probably going to happen a lot. When your perspective is what can God do, not what I can do, or what does God want me to do, not what I want to do, that's going to happen to you more often than not. Where you're standing up out here outside of this group of people and you're saying, I don't know how they think this is okay. That's happened to me multiple times. <coughs> Friends that I had for years, <coughs> they would start doing something and I'd be like, whoa, when did that become okay? And I have to take a step back. But let me tell you, it's hard when you're by yourself. Um, on, in verse 30, it says, You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb and Joshua. That's God talking. God told all these people, I brought you here and you couldn't even, you couldn't even have faith to step into it. And only Caleb and Joshua got to go into the promised land out of all these people because they believed in God. Because they thought differently. In verse 24, skipping around a little bit, it says, But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants, sorry, his descendants will possess their full share of that land. Um, so in verse 24, it says Caleb had a completely different spirit than everybody else. And that's supposed to be our goal. I know that sounds kind of weird, right? A completely different spirit than everybody else. But that's what happens when you ask Jesus to come into your life. Your spirit changes. Jesus comes in. Before you're by yourself and Jesus is kind of over here and he's like, hey. You know, he's with you, but he's like, hey, I'm over here. And then you ask Jesus to come into you and he's, he is always inside of you. He's with you before, but it's different. Your, your endoskeleton? Um, Jesus is always with you, but when you ask him to come into your life and you make that commitment, he changes you. You can't help but change when Jesus comes into your life. And that's a fact. If any of you guys have gotten truly saved, where you truly, which means that you've asked Jesus to come into your life, but you've also made an effort to turn your life toward Jesus... That's important. Because anybody can say the words. You want Jesus to come into your life. You want to be saved. 
But the true test comes when you have to actually put it into practice. When you have to actually work to be different. Something I want to say about being different is that sometimes it's lonely. But that's the reason you guys are here. Everybody in this room is supposed to be different. And everybody in this room, if we're supposed to be different than everybody that's not here, then we're supposed to be different together, right? We're not supposed to be alone. <coughs> the Bible says that man was not made to live alone. We're not supposed to be alone, but being different is lonely. It's the truth. If you surround yourself by people who are different than you, that don't understand you, you're going to be lonely. And that's why we fall. That's why you're always taught, if you're here, you've probably heard this before, to surround yourself, not that you surround yourself with people who think just like you, but you shouldn't go to a party where there's drinking and drugs. <coughs> if you're going to be the only one there that doesn't think that's okay, right? That's, that's the same kind of thing. You guys should be different together, which means you guys should be constantly lifting each other up and helping each other through your hardships. And if you do that, you're not lonely. We are called to be different in the world, but never alone in it. So while being different can be lonely, we're not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to have that person that's next to us that we can say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Can you pray with me? That goes for our youth group. You guys in the front row. Our youth group is set up because we want you guys to get to know each other. We want to get to know you because we are supposed to help each other. You guys help us and we help you. That's what we are supposed to help each other. You're supposed to be able to go to someone. The goal is that eventually you guys become close and that you can come to anyone in the youth group and say, hey, will you pray with me for this? That's the point. That's the community. For the church family too. That's the setup. That's what it's supposed to be. So... Uh, I'm going to read a few more scriptures because I love this passage of scriptures and I think it sums up really well what God's version of different is and what he's actually saying. Um, so it's Matthew 5, 10 through 16. And it says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You're the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. That's what God means by being different. And um, this little product thing I have, um, this little quote, it says, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not called to look or, look or act weird, but we're called to rise above the normal and live a life that glorifies Christ. And by that, you know, you guys weren't alive then, but even in this church, being different meant your outward appearance. And sometimes it, sometimes it can, but being different meant not cutting your hair or not wearing makeup. And... The truth is, being different is an inside thing. Being different happens in your heart, and then it comes out. 
but it doesn't mean you have long hair or short hair or your nails are painted or they're not. So it doesn't have to be, you don't have to, when people see you and point to you and say, see them, they're wearing that big hat, that's because everyone in that church wears that big hat and they have to wear it everywhere. No, that's not what being different means. Can you imagine, make you guys wear a 10 gallon hat? You have to go to, to come to this church, you gotta wear a 10 gallon hat. <laughs> but no, that's not what it is. That's not what different means to God. To God, it means your heart and your intentions and what you're doing to glorify Him. Um, so the last thing I'm going to say before we close tonight is, again, we're called to be different, but we're not called to be alone. And I want you guys to know, everyone in here, that if you don't have someone that you know you can turn to and talk to, find one. Even just one. Because I can bet there's someone in here that doesn't feel like they can talk to anybody, doesn't feel like they have anyone that can pray for them. And that's not what we're supposed to do in church. The church is to build a community of believers to help each other through life. Because life is not easy. We're supposed to help each other and lift each other up. We love you guys, and uh, I hope you know that you can come and talk to any of us. Any of us and um, I want you guys to be the good kind of different. I want you guys to be the different that, through your actions, people look at you and say, cool, there's something different about them. They weren't even asked to pick up the trash in their <coughs> classroom, but they stayed behind and did it anyway. Yeah, Amos. I <laughs> know. I'm just saying, if you do stuff like that, that's that means the world to people. People will look at you and say, wow, this kid is amazing. <laughs> and through that, you can bring glory to God. Uh, thank you, guys. And um, that's all I have for you tonight. So. <laughs>